There's a passage in one of Ajahn Lee's talks where he says that the breath is like a mirror for the mind. And this is why we look so intently at the breath, because it's going to teach us some very important lessons about the mind. How to find happiness by understanding where we cause suffering. Because that all comes out of the mind. How to find a true happiness. That comes from understanding the mind. And because it's so difficult to look directly at the mind, we have to look in the mirror. It's just like we have trouble looking directly at our own face. If you cross your eyes, you can see your nose. But there's not much else of your face that you can see directly. So you look very carefully at the mirror. The more carefully you look at the mirror, the more you're going to see of your face. It's the same way with the breath. The more carefully you look at the breath, the more you're going to be able to see the mind. But as with any mirror, you've got to learn how to make sure that it's flat and giving an undistorted reflection. So try to keep the breath as smooth and normal as possible. Now, normal here doesn't mean that it's just ordinary. Normal means that it feels healthy for the body. And that takes a lot of exploring right there. Because many of us are used to breathing in unhealthy ways, ways that seem natural because we've been doing it so long. But if you start asking questions about the breath, how it could be better, comparing the different types of breath energy in the body with one another, you begin to see that things may be out of balance. The left side may be breathing or doing the work of the breath more than the right side. Or you may be using the muscles of the head too much, thinking that somehow you can pull the breath in through your nose by tightening the muscles of your head or tightening the muscles of your neck or your shoulders, all of which is totally unnecessary and which is, does not help the breath at all. We pick up a lot of our ideas about breathing back when we were little kids, when we didn't know much. So it's important that we stop and take a look at this very basic process here, how we breathe, and ask a few questions about how we could breathe better in a way that's more balanced. Check to see, right? do you tighten up around pains in the body? Do you tighten up around old pains that are no longer there? Many times as you work through the body and work through the breath, you find a pattern of tension that you hadn't really noticed before it was there in the background. And as you allow it to release, a memory of an old injury will come up. Then you begin to realize you've been holding that tension since the injury. So you poke around and explore. And as you do this, you're employing some very important f factors in the mind. This is how you begin to see the mind reflected in the breath. It's a chant we had just now describing the first jhana. There's directed thought and evaluation in the first jhana, which means you direct your attention to the issues of the breath, and then you evaluate how it's going and what ways you can make it better. And when it does go well, how can you make the most out of that sense of pleasure? Not by wallowing in it, but allowing it to spread and directing it in certain ways to see if that helps, and learning how much direction is enough and how much is too much. Sometimes if you change the breath energy too drastically, it's going to give you headaches. So you've got to be careful. And as you do this, your powers of evaluation will develop, and your habit of Directing your mind to one topic will get stronger. This, of course, has lots of uses. 
if you have other jobs to do as you go through the day, you have to keep your mind on topic. You learn that you've got a stronger ability to do that because you've worked on it with the breath. That's one of the side benefits. But as you work with the breath and try to make it more comfortable, you're dropping, as the Buddha said, unskillful mental qualities. You're not really thinking about the central pleasures you might have tomorrow, the central pleasures you had today. You focus simply on how the breathing feels in the body, the space of the body as you feel it from within, which is a higher level of pleasure as you develop it, you work with the breath energy. You develop a sense of ease, well-being, pleasure. That's called sukha in Pali. And then there's the word bitti, which usually trans is translated as rapture. It also means refreshment. Sometimes rapture seems a little bit too strong as a description for what you feel. Other times rapture <coughs> seems just bright. It's a very strong, intense feeling of an energy going in waves through the body. And these two very pleasant feelings come from the fact that your mind is not engaged in sensuality. It's more engaged in just looking at the breath in and of itself, in engaged in the directed thought and evaluation. And you begin to see that your state of mind feels more at ease, nourished, stronger. And you're beginning to see how you actually have the power to shape your state of mind in the present moment, simply through these processes of directed thought and evaluation that give rise to very pleasant feelings. The perceptions you use and the feelings you use, these are called metal fabrication, because they're the metal processes that really have an impact on shaping your state of mind. So you've got the perception of the breath and the different ways of perceiving the breath that allow it to become more comfortable, the sense of well-being, the sense of refreshment, soothe both the body and the mind. And so you've got all the factors that the Buddha said shape our states of mind. Right here you've got the breath, which influences the way you experience the body, and that has a huge impact on your, your emotions. If things that would ordinarily irritate you come up, but the breath feels really comfortable and you're very immersed in this sensation of comfortable breathing, you find that the irritation just does not take over. It doesn't grab hold of you as an emotion. It just passes by, passes by. It's when a particular thought starts to hijack the breath. That's when the emotion digs in. It becomes more than just a thought. So this is one of the ways you have of protecting the mind from unskillful mental states is by getting the breath really comfortable and using your powers to direct a thought and evaluation to keep it that way, to allow the sense of ease that comes when you're breathing in a healthy, nourishing way, to seep throughout the body, to suffuse the body, permeate everything. This is how you learn about the, the mind, by dealing with the breath. You begin to see these functions really are important. As the breath gets more and more calm, more and more full, the activity of the in and out breath gets more and more refined. The sense of ease and well-being gets more refined goes through various stages until everything just gets very, very still. Even the in and out breathing can get still, because the breath channels throughout the body have a sense of fullness. They're all connected. If anything is lacking anywhere, the, the lack can very quickly be made up without you even having to bring the breath in or expel it in the ordinary way. Just by keeping everything connected, everything stays nourished. In your Breathing stops not because you're trying to stop it, but simply because you don't have any need. And that's when the activities of the mind really get clear, because there's no interference. 
It's like tuning a radio in. We have interfering noises. The signal is not all that clear, but as soon as the interference gets tuned out, there is the signal sharp and clear. When the movement of the breath calms down, the movements of the mind become more obvious. Because now your mirror is well polished, it's smooth, flat. You can see clearly whatever goes on in the mind. And because you've been made sensitive to these movements of directed thought and evaluation, as soon as they happen, you know them. A perception arises, you know that. This is probably one of the major lessons you learn from concentration, is what a huge role your perceptions. Perception here means the images, the metal labels you have that tell you this is this and that's that. It was the metal label of the breath that allowed you to stay with the breath. The metal label of stillness. And reminding yourself that the stillness doesn't mean you're going to be starved of breath energy. Everything is simply full. You keep that perception in mind and it's easy to stay with a sense of stillness. Some people, when they hit this, get afraid. They're not breathing and they're afraid they're going to die. Well, if the body needs to breathe, it's going to breathe. You don't have to worry about it. You keep that perception in mind. It enables you to stay here. So you start seeing how these perceptions have a huge impact over the way you perceive things. The more clearly you see the mind in this way, the more clearly you'll be able to see exactly what it's doing that's causing unnecessary stress anywhere, in the body, in the mind. Because you see all of this as metal actions. And you see that these actions have immediate impacts. And that's how you can start dealing with the big problem of stress and how to understand how it's caused and what you can do to put an end to it, because it's all happening right here. You've got a really clear mirror, a mirror that fills the body, so that any action of the mind can be detected as soon as it happens. This is why concentration is such an essential part of the practice. gives you the strength to stay here continually. And as you get the mind to settle down, you've learned a lot about the mind in the process. So that when things are really still, you recognize the different movements of the mind for what they are. So work on polishing your mirror. Because it helps you see things that you wouldn't have seen before, important things, the things that shape your life. And it gives you the opportunity to shape it in a better way. It's like looking in the mirror and seeing that you've got dirt on your face where you can wash it off. I like seeing that you're your clothes aren't matched, so you can change your clothing. It's not just a matter of sitting and watching things and saying, oh, that's the way they are. You see what can be changed for the better. So make sure that the mirror is good and everything else will follow. <laughs>